Today on the future of everything, the future of mining. When we think of mining, we think of deep tunnels leading to valuable deposits of gold or coal or diamonds. We may also think of the search for other precious metals that shaped so much of the Western United States, California and Alaska especially. But one of the main targets of mining today are the metals needed to create batteries, nickel, cobalt, lithium. With the increased emphasis on renewable energy sources, the problem in many ways becomes, how do we store energy that is episodic? The wind only blows sometimes, even in windy spots. Hydropower is probably much stronger in the spring during a big melt. When, and of course, for solar power, the sun is not up all day. So batteries, become critically important. As consumers, we see them in our cell phones and our computers and increasingly in our cars. But we need methods for storing electricity and we need better batteries and more of them. So we need a large amount of the basic ingredients required to make batteries. And that's where nickel, cobalt, lithium and other elements come in. Where are the world's stores of these metals? And how can we efficiently find them extract them in the most environmentally responsible manner, while also ensuring the safety and fair treatment of the miners who do all this work. Professor Jeff Cares is a professor of geological sciences at Stanford University and the director of the Earth Sciences Resource Forecasting. Jeff, how urgent is the need to find new sources of these metals? Thanks, Russ. Yes, absolutely right. Uh, one of the things I want to emphasize on what you said is that basically to address this climate change problem, we need to go from basically burning liquids to moving to an economy that's based on solids, some materials. And so right now, uh, the problem is that most of these uh, minerals, uh, particularly cobalt, uh, is only found in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, about 60% of the world reserves and much of the world production is coming from there. As you know, Congo has a lot of issues. The mining that happens there is uh, severe, poor human conditions, often artisanal mining by children, uh, poor environmental regulations. And so this is a huge problem. What we're essentially looking at, Russ, is that we are creating a new resources curse. We're going from this big pool of oil in Saudi Arabia to this big pool of metals that are in, the, in, in this country. And that's a, a, a problem that needs to be addressed. So there's a, there's a risk of having much of the history of the end of the 20th century repeated just in a new part of the world and with a new set of players. Absolutely. We're also lacking uh, still, if you think about, you know, I, I, I've made this small, simple calculation where imagine that every car in the world, right, uh, about one and a half billion cars to turn them into Teslas. So let's say, you know, Elon Musk's pipe dream is being fulfilled. Uh, I calculated that's about, need about six and a half uh, million metric tons of cobalt just to, to charge those, uh, to have those cars. Right now we have about the same amount discovered, but the problem today is we're only producing about 150,000 metric tons. So we're way, way behind in this curve. And this is what you're mentioning, this urgency of doing this is, is today. It's not sort of a pipe dream in the future where we can say, oh, let's develop a much better battery without all these polluting metals. Uh, essentially, we need to do this today because, you know, the tipping points in the climate is, are there happening in the next two decades. So I want to go back to something you said at the very beginning of your comments. You said we're moving from fluids to solids. Could you unpack that for me? What does that actually mean to, for, for uh, uh, I just, I want to explore that a little bit because I, I don't, I haven't heard it stated that way previously. Right. So the, our problem uh, often in sustainability is that of waste. What do we do with waste? We are, we're humans, we're producing all the waste. So right now we're taking these uh, oil and gas and we're burning them. And so the waste we're creating is gases. So gases are stored, basically our atmosphere is a waste dump for the gases that we're producing. So, uh, and one of the issues with that is gases are just difficult to capture when people are talking about CO2 sequestration, but to do that, you have to go to this huge, huge, fast amount of infrastructure. So with mining, of course, mining is very polluting, but it's, it's also very local. So it, there's a more ability to, to control. And the second thing is that we don't put any more liquids or, or gases into our cars, now we have this battery uh, that's there. I, you know, um, uh, the, uh, I, work, I collaborate a company in Berkeley called Cobalt Metals and, and Kurt House 
uh, the CEO told me that, you know, even in California, if you would charge your battery produced with coal ele burning electricity, it would still be better than with natural gas electricity. So, so there is- In terms of the waste product. In terms of the waste product and uh, being generated. I think people would find that is surprising. It is very surprising, yeah. So, so, okay, so I wanna go back a little bit to these metals. So um, you might need to give us a little, uh, uh, a metallurgy 101. Right. What, you, I mentioned in my introduction, mostly because I read some of your papers and, and, and watched some of your talks, that nickel, cobalt, and lithium are their major players. And I think everybody recognizes lithium and to some extent nickel batteries. Um, can you just tell us what's special about these metals and what is the status of the... You said, I think that there's probably enough cobalt around, but it's in the ground still and it hasn't been extracted. So give us a little bit of a, of a 101 tutorial about these metals and their roles in these batteries. Right, so the most uh, popular rechargeable battery today is the lithium ion uh, battery. And so to, to have a battery, as you know, you need an, an, an anode and a, a cathode and an electrolyte. Uh, Plus so that, right, so the anode is easy. That's just stuff that sits in your pencil. It's called graphite. Uh, the cathode you you're looking at creating uh, are using essentially metals that create that create batteries that have a high um, energy density. That is really the key. You want density and you want power. And those things are it's like a bathtub, right? You fill up your bathtub. There's a lot of energy, and you drain it. If you drain it fast, there's a lot of power. So uh, cobalt is just that particular sweet spot on metals that uh, creates that energy density and also has the safety issue. Because you may have heard about planes, you know, having lithium batteries that oh, catch yeah, fire. And so you don't want that. You don't want your Tesla car to catch uh, uh, be on fire. So, so cobalt has uh, these innate properties uh, that are there. So cobalt, of course, is not found in a, in a natural form. And it's, it's an elemental form. It's, it's found in minerals, you know, cobaltite and lineite. And there's all these kind of minerals that are around and there are these particular types of deposits because, because it's a metal, uh, the metallurgy, as you say, it's very important. The formation of these is very specific. You know, you don't find just in, in a sandstone or, or just a basalt, you don't find it. It has to be concentrated in the earth. And there are some very complex processes that are going on. And so this basically part. resulted from the formation of the earth, you know, a couple of billion years ago. Well, yeah, uh, so it, it's indeed, it's often associated with magmas, uh, magmatic sulfides, for example, they're found in Canada, uh, where these fluids uh, that are concentrated in the metals coming up and they then get deposited at, at the surface. Yeah. So this has been going on for much of geological history. Uh, these are processes that are keep going on, but of course they go on just like oil production at a, at a very fast millions of, of, of years of time scale. Okay, great. And so um, where do, are, are we moving from lithium batteries to cobalt batteries or is it more complicated than that? No, no, it's we build, build, having the lithium will be that main metal because it's a light metal. So that's why but the cobalt is the associated elements that creates the safety and the energy density. So you're mixing in the cobalt. In right, time. yeah. Would my typical battery in my laptop or cell phone have cobalt in it today it, or is it, that an emerging? It, it has. Uh, so your cell phone will have cobalt, but, but it's not an essential important element in the sense of the cost performance issue because your phone is very expensive. So that small amount of cobalt is not going to matter, but it's going to matter a great deal in electrical vehicles, of course, where you need a whole lot more energy. And so the cobalt amounts about four and a half kilograms into a Tesla that I you see. find. So these amounts and then also your home charging stations you know, they're going to have all that uh, cobalt needed for that. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Jeff Cares about batteries, metals, and mining. Okay, so we, we know that there are these geological processes that are forming, uh, especially cobalt, which seems like it's a especially a uh, a stressful <laughs> stressful metal to find these days. And, and you made a reference in your comments that... Uh, that there are spots in Africa, and in fact, perhaps not the most stable uh, governmental situations where a lot of this cobalt is found. And I know that you've done a lot of research in methods for identifying potential locations where you could then dig and look for. So what is the um, outlook in terms of discovering new sources or stabilizing existing sources that have been recognized already? So the, uh, the project and, and the ideas that I'm working on, also again, uh, together with uh, this company, 
uh, cobalt metals is really to find these battery metals in countries with stable regimes and environmental regulations, work regulations. And so that's gonna be very important. This is a huge challenge because half of the reserves are in the Congo. So we're lacking a lot of in, in, in countries where we need regulations, where we have regulations. The problem we have today in mineral exploration is it's an extremely slow process. This is very expert driven. You know, geologists go look at rocks and analyze it and you know they have their fun outdoors. Uh, I'm the indoor geologist, <laughs> I just do the, some, the software modeling. Uh, you don't get it, to do the field work. I don't get to do these the field exotic work. places. Yeah, I just go camping in the desert on my own, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on vacation. So the, here's the thing, Russ. The discovery rate right now is almost zero. We have, if you look at the history of copper deposits, cobalt is often associated with copper. Okay. I've been about 200 something major deposits found. Uh, about 15 have been found, I think, in the last 10 years, and only one has been found in the last, last year. And the reason for that is that all the major easy things to discover, they have been discovered. So now we need to go look subsurface, means under a cover of sediment where you have no idea you're standing on that on the ground. Let's say you're standing in Death Valley and you want to know what's under your feet. And so we need technology that is much faster than this expert driven kind of geology uh, driven or geologist driven expert exploration to more data driven and also AI driven type of exploration. Right. So a lot of those, um, what you were referring to as easy discoveries, the, the humans discovered patterns. They were probably pretty good at, at noticing patterns of the types of geographies and the types of, and so they, they were able to capture those. But now if you go to a whole new regime of types of um, deposits, all of their experience is without being disrespectful, irrelevant to these new potential sources. So how does data science and AI help you? Yeah, so I, I mean, that expertise is still very relevant, right? Good, it's good. understanding the data you're getting. Um, I see it uh, as, a, as, a, as a play in chess with nature, <laughs> right? It's, you, it's, 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 one move, it's not one move at a time. What you're gonna have to do is use geophysical techniques like remote sensing techniques, but they go underground and there are many types. Uh, things that look for magnetic anomalies or density anomalies, gravity anomalies, et cetera. We're Little signatures, signatures that the metal might send you after right. the probe. But we're looking at the area at a, say, the scale of Ontario, Canada. Oh. So it's not like, let's go fly a plane over Canada and we'll find them. This is like uh, uh, essentially a, a set of sequential decisions you're gonna have to make. You want to go there and if you didn't that what would you do next and what would you do next so what i'm working on is basically the same ai as deep mind is 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 trying to use to play chess against something but our chess is much more difficult because it's very uncertain where the pieces are so right. to speak of nature nature is laughing at us right now right. and saying i'm i'm holding my secrets but what are the moves we need to make and what are the data acquisitions that we need to take and what are optimized data uh, acquisition we need to take in order to ma have major discoveries. I see. So your metric of success there is um, reducing the false leads. So I, I guess it's a loss if you say we should dig here, forgive my language, and you dig and you don't find any cobalt right. and you would like to enrich so that on, for a hundred tries, you get a much greater uh, yield. Exactly. Yeah. Um, how is it going? And is this something that is done in industry or academia? I could imagine arguments on both sides. The industrialists, they have the ability to scale. I mean, you said it's the entire area of Ontario. That makes me think, OK, I'm not sure an academic can do that much. On the other hand, you have kind of access to the latest technologies in terms right. of AI. And so how do you do that balance? That's a good question, uh, Russ. And this is typical for a lot of the earth resources industries. The old industries, oil industry, mining industry, they typically have great expertise in geophysics, you know, a geology, but 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 they're lagging behind in, in the in the new technologies, uh, data and, and, and AI in particular. Yeah. And I think you're raising a very important question, which is how do we do this now? Uh, and how do we accelerate this, you know, sustainable energy future? I think the collaboration between uh, companies and the company I work at, uh, Cobalt Metals is a really visionary company. It's a company that does not only do the data engineering, the machine learning, the AI, but it's also a company that goes and actually does the drilling. So they're facing their own 
uncertainty models and, and decision. And they also pay for it if it's a bad guess. Right, exactly. They're footing the bill. They're footing their own bill. The biggest challenge for us in mineral exploration is what you called false positives, right? This is the bias in the data that if you just do machine learning, you run into a huge problem. Why? Because people have gone in areas where they looked for metals. So you have a lot of positives, but you don't have any negatives. Right. So right. you don't find the negatives and you have this imbalance. And the biggest problem that the mineral industry has in exploration is the false positive. As you said, you know, you go somewhere and there's just nothing there. And that is where AI comes in is to reduce this amount of false positives by leveraging data and machine learning. And, uh, and so the, the, the problem is today, uh, Russ, also is how, who does that? As you said, is right. academia doing that? Right, I was wondering how you split. Doing that? It's yes. really the synergy that we need. If you wanna accelerate this kind of sustainable energy, I feel it's the synergy that we have between companies and academia where the latest, newest thing is happening. But companies also have 10 data engineers that can you know, engineer the problem. If I'm a, a PI, I can just hire 10 students and right. you know, <laughs> right. make nice data sets. Uh, so that's, a, that's where this synergy is really needed. So for this collaboration with this particular company, how has the labor been divided? What are the things your team in academia is focusing on and what is the company focusing on? So the company is really focusing on upscaling the things that are done in academia onto a, a continent scale, okay. right? Where you're leveraging cloud computing, uh, you're leveraging data engineering uh, methods uh, in order to make this just happen at this scale. Because as I said, they're not just interested in making a software, they're interested in making an actual discovery and paying for it. An academic side, I've been looking for 20 years, we've been doing that for a long time, building up this, all these ideas and, and techniques of statistics. I'm a really more of an applied statistician uh, to, to, to say, okay, but with a, with, a, with a practice in mind to come up with those techniques that are required to do so. Uh, and that's not just you do in two years either. That is right. something that you do over a career. No, that's very exciting. And it sounds like it takes advantages of both the strengths at the academia and pushing the new fr frontiers of algorithms and data science, right. and then they're able to scale it up. Um, we're going to have more on the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, more with Jeff Cares about mining, lithium, cobalt, nickel, and uh, how to build better batteries in the future next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Jeff Cares about mining, geology, batteries. So uh, in the end of the last section, we were talking about all these great challenges for using AI, company and academic, uh, academic collaboration. I wanted to ask you about this idea of energy independence. Um, uh, you've written about it, you've talked about it. What is energy independence and why should we care about it? Yeah, I think it's a good question, Russ. And if you look at the United States, you know, in the, in the United States, we like to talk about energy independence. I like to come back to this car example that I, I mentioned in the beginning about this one and a half billion cars. So the United States has about uh, 300 million cars, a little less than that. So if you look at, again, at this analogy where four and a half kilogram of cobalt, just if you look, focus on cobalt in a car, that will mean about 1.25 metric, a million metric tons of cobalt. So I tell you today, we are mining uh, production 500 metric tons. Okay, so way, way this, off. W way, <laughs> it's like, <four laughs> like zero, it's essentially off. zero. <laughs> zero, uh, and we only have a known reserve of, of, of 38,000 metric tons. Now, when you say we, this is the United we, States. United States, yeah. Okay. So where, where there's just a number of problems with that. Of course, Cuba, if you look at Cuba itself, it probably has probably something like twice or three times the US on its own. Of course, we talked about uh, countries like Canada or, or as well, uh, Morocco, Finland, Russia. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it, you know, there, it, it exists in many areas. Another problem that- Are you saying that Cuba has three times more cobalt reserves than I'm, the United States? I'm gonna look States? at my numbers here. Uh, I think in production, it has about 10 times the United States. Wow. And, uh, and it has about 10 times the number of reserves. And this is basically just the luck of the draw about what's underneath Cuba. It is also a matter of exploration. The United ah. States has not invested, you know, our, our government has not invested simply enough. I can tell you an example. Uh, if you look at the databases, because when you, when you go into do this and you do data engineering, the databases in Canada 
are so much better than the databases in the United States when it comes to particular these metals. Uh -huh. right? There are, of course, great reports by the USGS, United States Geological Survey, but really to look at the next thing, which is go look for it and explore, drill, get more data, I, I believe we are we're way behind that with the relative to other countries. So, so this is important. So am I right in, in, in then inferring that we have very low reserves right now, but we really haven't looked. So there might be good news underneath the ground? There is. Uh, there are several areas in the United States, uh, Arizona, even California. If you, if you look at, you know, all the states uh, out there, there are probably 25 states where, you know, there could be cobalt deposits. Um, and so, so if we look better, if we start to uh, understand better through geophysical imaging and surveying uh, at a resolution where you can start to discover it because a, a deposit is not very big, right? You know, it's like a kilometer scale thing. It's not a 10 kilometer scale thing, but we're looking at the size of the United States. Again, we're looking at exploring uh, vast areas. So that investment has, has to come if we want to go and, uh, you know, mine our own uh, cobalt. The second thing I want to talk about is the processing of the ore, right? As you know, just like rare earth elements, um, you know, a lot of processing have done in China. Uh, I don't know necessarily about battery metals, but processing metals is a big mm -hmm. industry in metallurgy. And so that's another one of the pipeline that you need to uh, start thinking about if you go into this uh, energy uh, battery uh, energy uh, economy. So I am presuming that from your comments that we are not doing a lot of the basic uh, processing here in the United States. And, and, and to you, that represents a risk because we become dependent on foreign sources for things that we rely on, like our cars and our cell phones. Um, so there's uh, now, so very interestingly, you said that the database for Canada is very good and our database is not as good. So where will the will come? What needs to happen in the United States? And then of course, are you making it happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, there there is movement. Uh, there's movement in the Senate, uh, particularly uh, Murkowski, the Alaska senator. Um, she's really pushing uh, for us to really invest into this. I think the new administration with President-elect Biden is going to look at this. I think very seriously. Um, you know, also looking at a, of course, a science-based, uh, climate change-based policies. They're going to quickly discovered that that's going to also be one of the issues. Uh, you know, building of infrastructure is, is a, a big issue as well. We have to build new infrastructure. So, so it's this whole network of things that, that needs to happen. Uh, and and that, that's going to be key in the, for the future. So, so I'm sure that some of the people thinking about this topic are worried about the uh, process, especially the processing, uh, as a potentially uh, dirty activity. And, dirty, and what I mean by dirty is that it's a polluting activity. Yeah. So can you tell me about what are the challenges? How, how good is our processing capability and how green is it, for the lack of a better term? Right. Or is this yeah. something we really need to worry about? It's something we need to worry about. In metallurgy, of course, is, you know, uh, some of these cobalt minerals, they con contain arsenic, uh, you know, they're arsenites and stuff like that. So the metal industry, of course, is it's an issue, but um, it's, it's a whole lot less of an issue than say, uh, burning natural gas to create energy. Uh, this, the second thing is, I think, is that it creates a, uh, a, a, a recycling economy so it's a closed economy. Yes, I wanted to ask you about this. So for, right. for those three metals, how much can we reclaim at the end of a battery life? I, I don't know the real answer to that, but it's it's pretty it's probably very high. I think you're looking at, if I remember vaguely, but uh, it's about 90%. So there's a, a you can really create this closed loop economy where after, after time you have mined all the cobalt you need or all the metals you need and you just keep recycling them. Uh, now the recycling processes are polluting, um, but they are also concentrated in, in you know in, in these plants that we can start thinking about uh, or capturing the gases and whatnot that, that right. are associated with that. And that just becomes like many other things that becomes a, a, a an imperative research program to make sure that we invent a a future where this essentially becomes sustainable. So there is an initial right. harvesting from the ground, but. I guess I, I hope I'm not being Pollyanna-ish, but once that initial harvest has occurred, if if the technologies allow for the reprocessing of it, then it becomes much more sustainable. Yeah, exactly. And this is what I mentioned in the beginning of going from 
from liquids to solids, right? right? Solids is solid waste is just a whole lot more easy to recycle than gases. Yes. And, and this is the thing. Uh, and so that's, that's why uh, this is such a, a big revolution that has to happen. So now we have focused a lot on cobalt because as I understand, it's a limiting, uh, a limiting agent for a lot of these batteries. But can you give us a summary of what's the status of our nickel and lithium reserves? Is that fine, no problem? Or, or are there some challenges? There's also challenges there, Lesto. Uh, the problem with nickel is about a three times a, uh, sort of a production shortage in the future. We'll have to produce about three times more and there's a deficit right there. The problem with nickel is um, that it is often in low grade deposits. Mm -hmm. And so you have to mine much more of it. The processing is much more expensive. So in order to keep the prices low, you need to still um, uh, discover a lot of, of nickel deposits. Do you know if nickel is still used to make nickels in the United States? Oh, I, don't know. I have no idea. I, that's a good question. I, that, I this is a Google stump that. the geologist. To, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> this, uh, okay, so nickel, uh, the reserves are there, but it's uh, it, it, it takes a lot more work to extract right. from, from those reserves. What about lithium? Um, lithium, I'm, I'm not so familiar with. I've been focusing a lot on the cobalt and nickel numbers. Um, there are huge deposits, uh, particularly in, in Bolivia. And so Bolivia was, you know, was also ah. one of these countries are becoming the Saudi Arabia of lithium. Yes. Uh, so again, uh, discovering those deposits is going to be important as well. It's not just about the reserves. It's also about the, the geographic diversification of where you're finding things. You don't want to find everything in one country. Right. That's right. a problem. That's the resources curse that's going to happen. And, and so that for these countries that do have these reserves, they have a challenge of kind of nurturing it for the welfare of their people. But then there, of course, are great global pressures on them to distribute. And uh, exactly. and, this, yeah. and this is the Saudi Arabia challenge that you yeah. that you yeah. referred to. So is there good global cooperation in this area or is it every country out for themselves currently? It's much like that. You know, resources <laughs> is always every country out for themselves. Uh, it's market driven, uh, so it's capitalist driven. So it's it's not you know it's not a socialist system. So right. yeah, it's definitely every country for themselves. And I don't think we have uh, necessarily. I mean, people have analyzed this problem, but now we are facing this problem urgently in the next two decades. Uh, people, of course, are thinking about other types of batteries, and uh, Stanford is doing a lot of work and research, great research in this area. But those technologies are at least ten years away to become like really at the manufacturing right. scale of global right. and distribution. And this is the technology that we have in hand. So we need to make sure that there's at least a plan to continue that. Well, thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.